Karen Bondar, and you are watching Scientific American's Best of the Blogs for March 2013. In this month's installment, we're talking about new discoveries in the solar system, some solar-powered suitcases, crazy fish teeth, and the deal behind all of this gluten sensitivity. Dear Luke, I just saw a photo of your glass sculpture of HIV. I can't stop looking at it, knowing that millions of those guys are in me and will be a part of me for the rest of my life. It's a very odd feeling seeing my enemy and the eventual likely cause of my death and finding it so beautiful. That was an actual letter received by artist Luke Jerome about one of his glass sculptures, this one of HIV. His work represents such a juxtaposition between the beauty of these viruses and the devastation that they cause. And a lot of his work was featured on the Symbiotic blog this month. They're obviously incredibly beautiful, so people are automatically kind of attracted to things of beauty. But when they realize actually what they are, there's that element of sort of repulsion. Some people feel that they might get infected if they touch them, which is quite... So what exactly is a gluten sensitivity? And why are we seeing such an increased incidence of gluten sensitivity all over the place. And how can you have a gluten sensitivity but not have celiac disease? There's a lot of factors at work here and this month on the guest blog, Julianne Weirich sets them all straight for us. For something so small, gluten proteins have been blamed for a lot of trouble recently. We know that gluten causes celiac disease, but what does the diagnosis of gluten sensitivity really mean? While there's no easy answer, one recent study suggests that the innate or non-specific immune system may be to blame for gluten sensitivity. This is different than celiac disease, which results from a response of the specific or adaptive immune system. Even more interesting is another study that suggests that the symptoms of gluten sensitivity may not be caused by gluten at all. This study implicates a family of pest-resistant proteins in wheat called amylase trypsin inhibitors. As wheat is bred to be increasingly pest-resistant, ATI content increases as well, which could explain a growing number of gluten-sensitive people. Now that is some serious food for thought. But it's not all bad news from the medical health field this month. On her blog Unplugged, Melissa Lott talks to us about a solar-powered suitcase that is bringing hope to a lot of third world countries. When Dr. Laura Stachel went to Nigeria in 2008, she was hoping to identify some of the major causes behind the country's high maternal mortality rates. She'd expected to find women suffering from a suite of rare conditions, but instead, she found that the problems, time and time again, stemmed from a lack of light. Today, Laura, along with her husband and their team at We Care Solar, are supplying light to hospitals and clinics around the world. Using solar panels and a small lead acid battery, their solar suitcase can provide not only light for up to 20 hours, but it can also power a fetal Doppler and headlamps, and even charge batteries for life-saving technology. Viruses are just so incredibly small. It's right at the, the limitations of, of what science is capable of, of looking at. Uh, yeah. That exists. That's a real fish, and on her blog, Running Ponies this month, Becky Crew gives us a detailed description about why it has all of those teeth. Just like other animals, fish have evolved to have different types of teeth depending on their diets. Sometimes this means that a fish will look like its bird instead of teeth of a human being. A fully grown adult sheep's head, which is a common species of marine fish found in the coastal waters of North America, will have well-defined incisors in the front of the jaw, molar set in three rows in the upper jaw and two rows in the lower jaw, and a set of strong heavy grinders in the back of the lower jaw. As with humans, this unique combination of teeth helps sheep's head to process a wide-ranging omnivorous diet that includes lots of hard-shelled prey, such as barnacles, clams, crabs and oysters. As if the sheep's head fish wasn't scary enough, one of its close cousins actually can cause hallucinogenic episodes in humans if they happen to eat its flesh when it's been contaminated by a certain dinoflagellate. People have reported having all kinds of crazy dreams and hallucinations after eating this fish, which is a close relative of the sheep's head. This is the stuff of nightmares, people. 
In 2009, NASA launched the WISE satellite into space with hopes that it might be able to identify substellar objects called brown dwarfs. These things burn, but not as brightly as stars do, and they're much, much, much bigger than planets. They're very dim, so it's very hard to see them. On observations this month, John Matson tells us they indeed have reported finding a pair of brown dwarfs only six and a half light years away from us, which makes this pair of brown dwarfs among the closest star systems to us. In addition to locating brown dwarfs, the WISE satellite system could also be an extremely powerful tool for exoplanet hunters. This month, Jason Goldman from the Thoughtful Animal blog brought us an extremely unique picture of a bonobo. I asked him for his reflections on what the image means. I think it's really interesting that for so long, psychologists and biologists argued that non-human animal, animals don't really experience emotions. Uh, but to make those sorts of arguments, I think they must have had to work really hard to ignore photographs like this one. Well, that's going to wrap it up for the March episode of Best of the Blogs at Scientific American. Don't forget to check back to our blog network every day for so many cool stories in so many aspects of science. We'll see you back here in April.